Hey, welcome to the podcast. I'm Alex Girofanos, your space science podcast host from the East Coast. This week, we've got an amazing podcast. James Burke from the Mars Society. We get to learn about what got him into science and STEM and got him sucked into the world of the Mars Society where he's just living his best life, actually being on the front lines of getting humanity to actually go to Mars to make life interplanetary. So there's a ton we have to to break down in that whole People of Science segment coming up here. So that's coming up shortly. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you, everyone, for being uh, so <laughs> supportive online on, uh, on Instagram and online. You know, I, I took a week off. Finally had a week off of vacation in my day job for the first time in a very long time. They don't come that often. So I, I grabbed it. I took it. Uh, got to get a little bit of my life together. I cut my hair. We're actually looking like a normal human being here. <laughs> Less mad scientist, more like, hey, w- let's get this done. So anyways, um, I'm rambling here. Thank you for joining us. I had a great unwind last week. Uh, you know, thanks for, for bearing with us as I, as I take a week off here. Got to think the thing that's sticking with me the most is being up in in northern Maine. Uh, beautiful weather, beautiful night. It got completely clear. The Perseid meter shower was out. We we're lying on the dock, looking up at uh, a sky of stars that was so plentiful that it was incredibly hard to even make out what constellations were there because my pattern recognition for the awful awful new england sky uh is super bad whenever there's enough starlight visible we can actually see the tear or what i call the tear across the sky of, of just seeing the edge of the milky way galaxy and uh it's wild uh, but we had like one to two meteors every you know minute which was great uh, and there was a really great one that left a, a nice long trail that lasted a while. It was it was awesome. I needed that. I hope you get a chance to do that this summer uh, before the winter comes because winter is coming and uh, the world is as unknown as ever. But what is definitely known is we're back. We're ready for all things space and boy do we have an episode for you today. Before we start, we wanted to let you know a few things. So if you want to support the podcast and dive deeper into this episode, we wanted to share this. And we'll have this link on this week's episode. It'll be an Amazon affiliate link. So if you click on that and you purchase the Case for Mars by Dr. Robert Zubrin, which was a a, a pivotal book for James Burke, who we're going to speak to today, and myself, and plenty of others that came across this book. And it, it actually breaks down how we can make settling Mars possible with a technology that's close, it's not super theoretical, uh, and instead of saying, no, that's impossible, it's too hard, there's an actual case for Mars. So this is a great book. We'll have that link in this week's episode. I highly recommend it. If, you, if you've never gotten it, definitely do. Uh, the audio book, also very good. So definitely definitely recommend that Uh, and of course always this podcast is brought to you by ag 3d printing where we bring your ideas into reality with 3d printing we are in the middle of getting our starship prototype uh built so that we'll be able to have a lot more fun we showed it on uh episode 249 at the end of that episode and of course we'll have it up on our instagram page at ag 3d printing but we are here as a 3d printing resource you know, if you're trying to get into it for the first time, if you'd like to just make something, uh, get something 3D printed, bring an idea from your mind to the sheet of paper where you've scribbled it down. Maybe it's a napkin. Maybe you're like J.K. Rowling and writing Harry Potter, you're writing a napkin. You bring that to us, we can help make that something that's in your hands and test it out, right? Spend some money seeing if an idea is worth it, if it, if it really comes to life in your hands and then You get even more passion for it, to inspire yourself for it, to know this is real. This is what I thought it was. We love bringing ideas into reality. So that's what we do here. And then, of course, we offer our 3D printing services for students that are out there. You know, there's plenty of people who have 3D printing labs in their schools, but there's not enough space. And especially now with COVID, which labs are open, which, how do I actually get access to that? 
uh, and, and how supply chains are breaking down around the world. 3D printing really stepped up in this last year as an option uh, not to produce tremendous amounts of quality uh, of quantity of things, but uh, of very good quality and rapidly. Uh, and what we specialize is rapid iterative design, which allows you to take an idea from step one to the first actual working prototype. Uh, and each one you get a little bit better and you fine tune it. And then after a few of those, you have a full fledged product. You can bring it to market. You can uh, start with a premium product. There's a lot that you can do, even down to just stuff around the house. A fun thing, a good gift, which we have our Etsy store, ag3dprinting.etsy.com, uh, which also supports this podcast. It's, it's going through uh, stuff like that that supports us. It helps us fund this podcast, keep the lights on, and eventually travel to places like Florida, like Starbase in Texas, where we will be able to go and capture that stuff live in person, obviously. Uh, we'll see how the world goes here in a few minutes, but that this builds up our ability to go do things like that and even uh, gather more equipment to do more things. Uh, we're looking to get into astronomy soon, so we're looking to hear back about what's going to happen there, but we're looking to invest into today in space and make this bigger, and through AG3D printing that lets us do that, and things like grabbing uh, books like The Case for Mars on the affiliate link below. All of those things help, and of course, liking subscribing sharing with others sharing with your friends and spreading the word helping us spread love and spread science to get this word out there get this podcast out there and 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 build it from the ground up like we've been doing for the past six years and and we expect to do it for for a lot more and we've got so many uh, amazing conversations coming up here in the in in the next few weeks and months uh it's wild i'm really glad i took that week off to uh <laughs> get myself ready to go so that we're good to go here so without further ado i want to introduce you to james burke our people of science segment we'll dive into his stem origin stories and then talk about the mars society and everything to do with mars and space enjoy thanks for joining us Welcome, everybody, to Today in Space. This week, we have a special guest, James Burke. Um, we're going to be having a segment of People of Science. We're going to learn about uh, what got James into this and, and, and where he's become this contributing member of the Mars Society. We're going to learn a little bit about the history of the Mars Society and where it's been, where it's going, and what's, what's new and what we should be looking into. So, James, thank you for, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. It's an honor. Um, so let's let's start with your STEM origin story. Where did this passion for science and Mars and, and all that stuff start? You know, it's as long as I can remember, I was just really interested in space. I think the earliest memory I have um, of really my love for space was how excited I got when I went to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. I think I was mm -hmm. about eight years old. Oh, man. Um, and just seeing the spacecraft there, you know, even like the Wright Flyer and uh, X mm. the Bell X-1 that Chuck Yeager flew. Um, I was just so passionate about that, even that young. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go into the Air Force and fly fighter planes and, and eventually fly space planes like oh, Buck wow. Rogers. Cool. Um, <laughs> and I still have, like, when I went on that trip, um, we went to the gift store there at the Air and Space Museum. And my mom said, you just, you know, what do you want to get? I'll get you one thing. And I picked out this book and it's called the Omni Space Almanac. Oh, wow. It was, it was in 1984 that this was published. And I just devoured this book. I mean, I read this book <laughs> cover to cover many times. And in it, it has project timetables for when we're going to go settle the moon and go to Mars and settle the solar wow. system, you know. And they're all from the vantage point of the early 80s when things were maybe going a little faster yeah. than they ended up going. So I always kind of look back at that. I'm like, mm, 1990, that's when we should be going to Mars. Why did yeah. it happen? So. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that was really interesting that happened to me, I was in third grade in Orlando, Florida, when Challenger happened. Uh. And I actually, we were on recess and in Orlando, Florida, it's not that far from the Cape, so you can actually see shuttles launch uh, in the sky from there. And mm. so we saw the smoke, and everyone was like, thought it was normal. It was like, oh, the shuttle took off, and it was like a regular thing right. at that point for people in Florida. We'd mm. hear sonic booms all the time. It was just not, not a big deal, right? 
right so I, but i like kind of was like oh the smoke lo looks a little different it kind of has this b yeah and i was thinking to myself i wonder if something happened mm. and then um it was so crazy because my teacher had me go get the radio mm. i think she caught wind that something had happened and so i'm like third grade carrying the radio into my classroom and they literally are saying the challenger had exploded wow. apparently and so it was this whole kind of moment that was very real um to you know to everyone in my generation we all remember that but yeah it was so weird that like i was the one that brought that news to my yeah classroom. i got i got goosebumps thinking about it man that that's yeah. uh that's intense wow uh and and to, to not understate this at all like the the shuttle is such a big and those disasters like there's such a big nexus point for everything that's happened with space those timetables being off i mean like it, it's the now that we're getting humans to start flying even to just to the edge of space it's this weird like emotional ride i mean it's not the shuttle which i thought it would be related to the shuttle mm -hmm. but now that now that even just a trip in into zero g is still like an emotional thing which is wild to me yes yeah. And then the, the third story I want to briefly tell is mm -hmm. when I was in college, Mars Pathfinder happened. Mm. And that had a transformative effect on me. I was a young man. I was about to graduate uh, from University of Florida. And I was just glued to CNN and C-SPAN when that mm. mission was happening. I watched every moment of the press conferences. Wow. I went on the website. The, 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 the web was very early then in 1996, 1997. Yeah, but I had a computer, you know, and and I was on the web constantly, and I must, you know, they said the Mars Pathfinder website had the most hits ever. I'm sure half of them were me. Wow. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was a huge deal, and you know, later on in life, I've gotten to meet a lot of the people that worked on that mission, like Rob Manning, wow. who was the EDL lead. I, I just talked to him at the conference, the Mars Society conference, a couple years ago. That was a huge deal. That's him. amazing. <laughs> now so that's scientists at JPL. So yeah. So you've had quite the quite the journey to get to this point now with Absolutely. Mars Society. It, 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 is the Mars Society kind of like a great way for you to just experience all the things that you just were in love with growing up as a kid? Absolutely. I'm yeah. living my dreams. I really am. Yeah. Um, so my journey with the Mars Society started when. I read this book, The Case for Mars, and this is the actual copy I read. Got mine. <laughs> um, this is the original back in the That's mid 90s. Awesome. It, was, it was published. And I was I had just graduated college. I went off to uh, work at Microsoft here in Seattle. And so mm. my wife and I were driving cross country to start my new job. And that was the book I read in the car. Oh, wow. And as I, when we got to Seattle uh, in the months after that, the Mars Society uh, was being organized in, mm. in august of 98 was our first conference and so you know a few months later i'm part of the mars society and the guy that wrote the book dr robert zubrin is literally calling me on my desk line at microsoft <sighs> you know, hey james can you help me get a meeting with bill gates to talk about a mars mission oh, him man. funding a, a mars mission or him funding some of our activities you know so that was it was very kind of they threw me right in the deep end at the Mars Society. I was I was an early volunteer, and now I'm the director of IT. That's a position I've been in for ten years now, but it's it's been quite a, an experience to be part of that organization. There's been so mm -hmm. many great things I've gotten to do, and people I've gotten to meet because of that. That's that's so awesome to hear. I, you know, one of the things that we try and do here on the podcast is like introduce people to all the different ways that you can get involved in, in space. You know, for me growing up, it was. You know, it was even a shock that you could even work on the space shuttle. Like that was a job you could you could get. Um, but it's so interesting how little you actually know for a lot of people going into aerospace or anything space related. Like, how do you get places? So your story is, I think, amazing because like it's just another pathway to get really involved. Um, I think there's a there's a misconception that you have to do the traditional engineering route, which in many cases, I mean, you're behind the desk. You're never going to be talking with these people that, you know, you've, you've been able to work with. It's, it's a small group that gets to do that. Um, so, so let's talk about the, the, the Mars Society. Like what, tell anyone that may not be familiar with it at all. Um, let, let, let's, let's give a breakdown for them. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we are the world's largest nonprofit organization that's specifically focused on sending humans to Mars. Mm. We want to settle Mars. We've been at it now for 23 years wow. um, this August. And so, um, you know, the, the amount of progress we've made in those 23 years to me is just amazing. I mean, now you have, now we could really taste Mars. It's, yeah. it's close. <laughs> I mean, it's going to happen. Like it's not this 50 to a hundred year science fiction thing. Yeah. Now we're almost there. And, and you and I and others listening, we're going to see it happen in our lifetime. Yeah. Because it's going to happen very soon. Um, and so we're, we've been all about that. We have chapters around the world. We're, we're, made, we're made up of everyday people um, that, are, that are interested in Mars and that are trying to see what they can do to contribute to that mission of settling Mars, of, of opening up. Mars is a second home for humanity. Mm. You know, and we go there. We don't go there to leave Earth. We go there to help understand Earth and help make life on Earth better for everyone by developing technology and science and increasing our awareness of the universe. Yeah. And so it's not this, you know, a lot of people say, why don't you spend so much money is spent on space. We got to spend that money back here on earth, deal with all the social issues, deal with yeah. all the pollution and the climate change. Well, I would argue that we can do both. We can mm. actually explore space and develop new discoveries and develop new technologies. Yeah. that have dual uses back on earth to solve a lot of those problems. I mean, space, there's an abundance of resources in space. Mm. And there's so many things that humanity is going to be able to do once we learn the, the skill of traveling to other planets, of setting up colonies and settlements and um, orbiting space stations around the moon and Mars and earth um, and, and the outer planets. There's so many things we're gonna be able to do to help mm what the situation is here on earth so yeah the, so that's so we're we're laser focused on mars we have people that work at nasa that work in esa there's so many things happening right now um with the mars yeah. society it's, it's <laughs> kind of overwhelming sometimes but uh I, you're, you're so busy yeah i i've been following you on linkedin and, and seeing all the different stuff you've been doing and like it's it's wild um I guess let, let's talk about some of the newest stuff that you're working on. I think it's a good time to transition to that. Absolutely. So I'm really excited about our Mars VR project. We are about to do our first public release of that. So let me talk a little bit about that. We've been at that sure. for four years now. Um, the goal with Mars VR is we wanted to take virtual reality and use it as a tool to not only help the science of exploring Mars of, of, we have a base in Utah, I didn't mention this yet, mm. called the Mars Desert Research Station. And we've been operating that base for 20 years. That's kind of our flagship effort at the Mars Society is we mm. do this Mars analog research base. We've had over a 1, thousand, 1200 people go through it, um, over 250 crews. I'm gonna actually go there in December. I'm gonna command oh, a mission awesome. there in December. Um, and so we have this, we're doing Mars in, in the Utah desert. And so what we thought with VR was, why don't we take that base we have mm. and put it into virtual reality? And there's a couple of things we could do with that. We can train everyone that goes out there on how to do their, their work. Oh, how, do, yeah. how do they check all the propane and, and water tanks? How do they put on a spacesuit and go outside? Mm. How do they use the facility, use the, the kitchen, use the science lab, and, right. use, and grow plants in the greenhouse? and use the RAM, which is how we repair equipment. So learning how the acclimating everyone to what that campus is like mm. was sort of the main goal. But also we could tell the story of all that to yeah. the general public. We could say, look, we're out there doing Mars. This is what it's like. This is what you could aspire to be. You know, you, if you learn your science and your math, you can go explore Mars like we do, except it'll be Mars and not Utah. Right. Um, and, and I've had the opportunity to show that demo of the Mars VR to, you know, I showed it to 200 uh, underprivileged schoolgirls, middle school age girls in Seattle mm. a couple of years ago before COVID. And they wow. were like floored at how cool it was. Like 100% of people that mm. put on the VR headset love it and are, yeah. are just inspired. So we thought that with Mars VR, it could be not only a training tool for us, but it could be a public outreach tool. So we, we raised 
our first round of money was uh, in 2018. We held a Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Our goal was twenty five thousand dollars. We actually raised thirty one thousand. Awesome, because uh, it was so popular. And we built the demo. We built the proof of concept. We scanned uh, with a drone. We scanned a square mile of terrain in Utah around our base. Looks just like Mars. It's the Utah Southern Desert. Yeah. There. Um, looks exactly like Mars. You got big cliffs and sand buttes, and you know, um, it's it's great. It's a great area. Very yeah. geologically similar to Mars. Yeah. And then we. We have our campus. There's about six buildings that we've built there. The HAB, which is kind of like a landed spacecraft. And we have like a little science dome that we built, yeah. like a half Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome. It's and, uh, so just, just like uh, if anyone's even like slightly skeptical, please go take a look. Like it's it's I love the idea of analog astronauts. I don't know why it took me so long to to come across it. But um, that idea is so it, it's such a good idea for for prepping while the technology gets developed, you know? Like, and I think it's so cool that you've, you've double purposed this. You know, you guys as an organization, you're like, hey, we need to train people. What's the easiest way so we don't have to spend tickets flying them out, bringing them in. How do we make the most out of this? Like, it, 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 there's so much value that I'm so excited about. I can't even <laughs> express it. But um, where is there a place where people can like check out uh, the project right now, maybe see some views okay. of this? Yeah, marsvr.com is our website and as i mentioned we did the first round in 2018 we just did another round of funding with uh indiegogo mm. and this time we raised one hundred and six thousand dollars. <laughs> dude that's so awesome. we are <laughs> we are just in the thick of development right now this summer we're trying to get our first public release done oh, it's wow. very close i just saw uh the latest build a couple weeks ago i went down to this company in seattle that we have working with us on it uh, jeff rayner and his company mixed reality and they've like really done a great job getting the, the 3D models working for the for all the buildings. Oh wow! And we're working through the training. Right, actually, even going to add an Ingenuity helicopter oh. simulation where you can fly the helicopter. You can be the helicopter, or you can fly it. Wow! And then you're also going to be able to drive a rover. So we have these Polaris EV rovers that we have in Utah. It's kind of like a cross between a golf cart and a pickup truck, but it can go oh. off road because we only have dirt roads there. Right. And so, and I've ridden in one for real, but in this, in the VR, you're going to actually be able to drive one on an obstacle course or even do races with them. Oh, cool. Uh, Multiplayer. (laughs) And we have a a physical apparatus called Yaw VR that we're Mm. partnering with. So we're actually going to put this in museums and in some cases, school will have one where you could actually sit in this little egg shaped cup and it gimbals and you're, and you have the VR headset on. So you really, really feel like you're driving uh oh, in, the, in the sim so yeah so the, the next round of, of what we're doing with mars vr is we want to get the first public release out mm-hmm. it's free it's open source we're trying to do this to improve mm-hmm. the tool set out there for telling the story of mars and vr um mm-hmm. but we're going to then add on the, tra- the training modules to it that people would purchase things like the rover driving they would purchase mm-hmm. um to try to generate revenue for us to do follow-on work Awesome. So it's very, it's this pipeline we're doing. It's a multi-phase effort. We, I, I mentioned we've been at it for four years. We're not yeah. going to finish with this public release. We're actually going to do this long term and keep adding to it. Wow. What I'd like to do eventually with Mars VR is I'd like to have a fully immersive Mars settlement mm. simulation. So, you could, so we could try out different base designs and you, you could just imagine all the possibilities of VR with Mars. I mean, we could have yeah. One of the visions we have is when the astronauts first go to Mars and they land, they could scan the area they land at, mm. send that all back to Earth, all that data back to Earth, and we could put that into a VR simulation. And people back wow. on Earth could actually explore the real landing site that the astronauts are at, try to find interesting things, like try to find interesting geology or maybe water, wow. maybe even fossils and send that back to the astronauts and then they can go there for real and, and find that Whoa. So that synergy crowd exploring you know how yeah concept of crowdsourcing where you like nasa does this a lot where they say okay we need this specific part mm-hmm. or we have this specific technical problem we'd like a solution for it so here's the problem mm-hmm. send a, send in your ideas yeah get back dozens or hundreds of ideas or dozens or hundreds of designs for the part and then they'll pick one they call that crowdsourcing. Well, we call this crowd exploring. 
it's like we're going to put the vr environment out there for people to explore the landing site they're going to yeah. find all this cool stuff maybe there's like a little way to vote on like where the astronauts should go yes and the astronauts and nasa or spacex or whoever and say okay this is what the public thinks let's go check that out oh my god that's wild so could you i'm just thinking of all the possibilities here like is this something you guys could do in prep to the real mission like virtual missions that you just bring people in and kind of simulate that at your at your base in utah um, yeah we, we've talked about doing some synergy between someone out on eva in utah mm. and then having a vr companion to guide them we could we're going to try some of that during my mission where i'm there in the hab and someone's out on eva and we have a real-time communications link awesome um but yeah you could totally do that you could have the astronaut on eva have augmented <laughs> reality goggles yeah and they see like the person that's exploring with them or, or they're talking to them <laughs> yeah no, it's really that's the future right that's yeah, like it is next level stuff so. It, it's 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 breaching into sci-fi and like the tech is finally here like i could i could have seen maybe 10 years ago you know having the ability where you could go in there but you're kind of limited to like the areas kind of like old school video games where like you had to have a section load and go right. through that and then you're you're kind of in a box a boundary box where right. this kind of opens it up like you're you're in the world like you're in that area yeah I mean, that's wild i mean right now we still have a boundary box but it's a square kilometer so i mean that's a feel like you're in a box. yeah <laughs> you have plenty of time to look through everything <laughs> yeah. and, and there's much cool. more interesting terrain out there in utah i mean there's a whole canyon mm. system called the Somervale that's near the hab mm. it's a couple uh, kilometers away we usually take rovers to it and oh, it's cool. like being at the grand canyon you're like on this butte on this ridge and there's like this massive canyon in front of you. Mm. And so I, I want to tell that kind of story in VR too. We got we haven't scanned that yet, but I want to mm. do that as well. So there's so many That's possibilities awesome. with the VR project, <laughs> you know, and yeah. now we have the funding. So it's very exciting. We're going to be able oh. to pull some of this off. Oh, congrats. That's, I'm so happy to hear that. It's such a cool project. Like I, there's, so let's talk about like where we are right now with going to Mars. Cause I think yes. there's, and, and even, you know, Dr. Zubin talked about it in the book, like all the all the worries about what was ready and what wasn't ready. Like it's been the excuse for more than a decade at this point. Um, so where do you see us now with going there? We mentioned before it's very close. Um, obviously, we've been following Starship here for forever, as long as it's been around so far. Um, what are some some stuff that you're excited for that's going to bring us to this next level? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things Dr. Zubrin talked about in his book is the the main, the main enabling technology is launch technology. It's, mm. it's, it's decreasing the cost per pound to orbit. Uh, back with the shuttle, it was ten thousand dollars a pound or more. Mm. Um, now, what you see is this explosion of launch technology. There's literally over a hundred companies working on rockets and working mm. on rocket technology led by SpaceX um, with their Falcon 9 rocket, which is the most successful rocket ever built. It's Wild. reusable. <laughs> um, there's, there's some Falcon 9s that have flown more than five times to orbit and back and they land. Yeah. I mean, that is a transformative technology that is dramatically lowering the cost to go to space. But Starship is a whole other level because with Starship, you have a two-stage reusable rocket and if you fuel that first stage in orbit, you know, you launch it to orbit mm -hmm. and then you launch another craft to refuel it. If you have a fully fueled starship in Earth orbit, the solar system is now opened up to you. You can yeah. literally go land on the moon with it. You could go land on Mars and you could go to the outer planets with people. This is with people. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and, where we're at, Elon Musk and SpaceX, they're essentially, they're not building one Starship, they're building a whole factory line of them down in Boca Chica, Texas. Yeah, It's very exciting what they're doing there. It's very innovative. Um, and they're very close at this point. It's July of 2021. It could be that they will go to orbit with Starship by the end of this year. Mm. Certainly they're on a path to do it within a year. Yep. And once they fuel that, once they have a way to refuel that orbital starship hmm. they they're going to go to the moon next i mean they already have a mission planned to go around the moon mm -hmm. with a japanese billionaire 
and a bunch of regular people along with yeah. him. We bought like yeah. six seats on the starship to go yeah, around. Yeah, Yusaku Maezawa and the Dear Moon Project. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's that's coming very soon. That would happen, in, I think, in my estimation, less than two years from now. Yeah. That's going to happen. I'd agree. And, and then that mission, and I talked, you know, I was, I had the opportunity to inter interview Elon at our conference I'm last glad year. you're bringing this up. I wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah, and I actually was able to get some dates out of him. Not a lot of people were able to do that when they're the <laughs> journalists that talked to him. But actually, because we're, you know, both Mars geeks and Martians and everything. Yep. I, I think he felt a little more open talking to me and Dr. Zubrin. So yeah. what he said was once they go around the moon, then Mars is about two years after that. So the first cargo ship to Mars, it could be as soon as 2026 at this point. Yeah. Um, to, to the first real mission. Um, I mean, 2024 is a little bit of a stretch, but it's yeah. also doable. So 2026 right. is what it looks like, which would mean that 2028, the next opportunity would be people. Yeah. So that's how close Mars is with with the Starship architecture. It's crazy. Now, if, if you take Starship and Elon Musk and SpaceX out of the equation, mm -hmm. there is still so much going on with space right now with launch technology. You've got Rocket Lab. Mm -hmm. You've got Blue Origin, who just launched Jeff Bezos and his brother and, and Wally Funk and <laughs> the 18-year-old uh, Netherlands guy. They yep. just went to space in a, in a Alan Shepard suborbital. 10, 11, 10, 11 minute flight, but that's that's a precursor to bigger things for Blue Origin. Definitely. We have a plan for a larger rocket called New Glenn and then an even larger one called New Armstrong. Oh, that I haven't heard about New Armstrong. Armstrong. Wow. Yeah, New Armstrong is essentially their moon rocket. Um, it's like Saturn oh. V class. Okay. It, it's, it would be fully reusable. Wow. Um, that's probably like 10 years out, but New Glenn's coming. I mean, they're already working on New Glenn. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's a Falcon 9 class rocket that's mm -hmm. orbital, but fully reusable and using hydro wow. hydrogen liquid hydrogen propulsion, um, so it just outputs steam. You know, yeah, it's very, which is great. Friendly. That that has been kind of blowing some people's minds lately. I, I think there's still this expectation that you know anything burning out of a out of a flaming rocket is going to be toxic, and I mean that's been the case since shuttle that it's been you know pushing out water and, instead of anything else. So. Um, it's, it's been interesting you know i'm sure you get these questions a lot you know being involved in, in space so much the the different things that people are catching up on now that space is really in the zeitgeist of every day um is, is there any questions that you get asked a lot that you're surprised i like to talk a lot about the martian sometimes and people ask me how mm. accurate that was they, they like that movie and that book too and they say well how accurate was the martian because yeah. that's really the the, the best example of a popular culture reference to mm. Mars that you know everyday people know about. You know right. that was a, that was a popular movie. Matt Damon was in it, and so I say, look, that movie was pretty accurate. Like we yeah. were excited when that movie came out. Yeah. But one thing that wasn't accurate was the way the atmosphere works on Mars. <laughs> he wouldn't have gotten blown around like that. Right. The right. Movie. If right. there was a dust storm that big, which they do happen, it would just cloud his vision. It wouldn't mm. actually take him off his feet because the atmosphere on Mars is one one thousandth of the Earth. So um, you'd actually, yeah. if you were standing on Mars, you would actually feel colder at your head than your ankles. That's how wow. thin the atmosphere is on Mars. Wow, that's wild. I knew the temperatures are extreme, but that's a, that's a great example for like what it would feel like. Yeah, and people also huh. ask, like, Mar is Mars hot? Mm. Like, is Mars, a, Mars is a desert planet, that's true, but right. is it hot? Right. I'm like, no, it's not hot. It's very cold there because there's hardly any atmosphere and you're farther mm -hmm. away from the sun. So the hottest it ever gets is still below freezing sometimes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's another question I get. But the temperature fluctuations are pretty wild on Mars. Mm. No, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot I think we've got to catch people up to for getting us ready for going to Mars. I think. I think there's like right now we're already seeing a slip of the ex like the story behind uh, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. I think there's this narrative being developed right now that it either came out of nowhere, you know, like they just decided to build a rocket and launched it when this has been two decades in in the making. Um, yeah, SpaceX started in 2005 and they yeah. had four failures of Falcon 1. <laughs> before they had a successful launch. And Elon says like they were pretty much gonna shut down 
Yeah. But they got this last minute infusion of cash from NASA to finish Falcon 1 and they launched it successfully and that directly led to Falcon 9 and where they are now. So yeah. that's how close they were. But yeah, they've been at it, you know, in almost 20 years now, 16 years. Mm -hmm. Blue Origin too. Blue Origin was very secretive at the beginning. They kind of yep. still are, but they weren't, nobody knew what they were doing. Um, and yeah. now it's coming out how, how much, I mean, that mission they just did, mm -hmm. that was over-engineered for a space tourism flight. And that's what Jeff Bezos mm -hmm. said at the post-launch press conference. Like, if you were just going to engineer a spacecraft for a tourism flight like that, an 11-minute suborbital up and down flight, yeah, that's not, that's not the architecture you would pick. You wouldn't pick a reusable two-stage rocket that has hydrogen propulsion. Right. <laughs> um, you'd pick something a lot easier to build. But the reason yeah. they did that is they over-engineered it because they could scale all that whole system up right into new Glenn and new Armstrong. Mm. So, yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting with blue origin. I, I think the, to your point, like you were saying, SpaceX almost ran out of money. That's kind of the telltale telltales tale of, <laughs> of uh, a lot of billionaires doing space companies is they right. usually run out of money before they're ever successful. And Jeff, has a lot of money. That's not going to so, run out of money. No. no. <laughs> so they it's can funny, take as like, long as they want. It's funny. Elon was actually uh, after he sold PayPal in the yeah. late in the late nineties, early two thousands. He was looking for what to do next, and he actually joined mm. the Mars Society back in two thousand two. And he was on our board for a couple of years before he mm. started SpaceX. And Dr. Zubrin actually tried to talk him out of SpaceX wow. because. We had just seen this guy, Andrew Beal, in Beal Aerospace, mm. just use his whole fortune up on space and not, not get anywhere with it. Yeah. So Robert Zubrin was like, that's Elon, don't, don't do it. Yeah. You're going to waste all your money be <laughs> just like Andrew Beal. But here's the difference between Andrew Beal and Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the kind of guy that could teach himself rocket science by reading books. Yes. And he really did that. I mean, yeah. that guy is... That guy knows everything about what SpaceX is doing. He's the chief engineer of SpaceX. Yep. And he did that all on his own. He's self-taught. So he's just not a normal human being. No, he's definitely not. And he's definitely a benchmark that I like reach for as, as an engineer. Like being able to get dirty on the ground floor, of, literally of the manufacturing floor to figure out the problem. Like that that's an ability that Jeff, uh, nothing, nothing against Jeff Bezos, but it's not an ability he has. And it's not an ability that Richard Branson has. Um, so there's so many tiny problems and probably points they would have gotten to that they wouldn't have gotten through without Elon there pushing it, pushing it through. Yeah. Um, he does the work. It's all about does. doing the work. A lot of yeah. things with in life, it's like, Hey, here's a great idea, but to make it reality, you actually got to hit your nose on the grindstone and, mm -hmm. and roll up your sleeves yeah. and, and really work through it. And that's what Elon, I mean, Elon literally sleeps at the factory floor at, tesla yeah. i kind of worry about the guy because i do too when you see him in person he's he's pretty like stressed and yeah like hasn't slept a lot and things like that but mm -hmm. that's what works for him he's a workaholic he you is. know i kind of am too yeah um, he's got asperger's <laughs> um and a lot of it's funny i i have a little touch of that too my daughter yep. has it mm -hmm. but uh it's it's just means like we're we like to work it's fun to work it's fun it to is. like accomplish something significant Yep. That's really what gets me up in the morning is, is trying to do something that is yeah. for its humanity and for others. So. I'm, I'm totally in that with you. I, I haven't been diagnosed with anything, but, um, but yeah, I, I have that. There is a, <laughs> you talk about getting up in the morning, uh, having that passion, like that is exactly what my projects, this podcast, like all that other stuff, like, and in my day job too, in engineering. Um, yeah, that gives me so much value and, and just, uh, I guess momentum to to push through when things get tough because they're always going to get tough. Um, you have a, it, to believe in what you're doing and, and have a yeah. goal and just focus yeah. on your goal. It's all about focus too. Not it is. just working hard, but focusing yep. and working smart yes. on the thing you're trying to, to accomplish. Oh, let's dive into this because I love this. That's a great conversation because there's there's so many engineers and people that that work hard that will work themselves too hard. I'm I'm one of those people. I'm literally in the process this year of pulling it back, but being more specific about when I'm a hundred percent, like giving myself like, okay, from 10 to two, I'm going to be on this and it's going to be as, as full throttle as I can put it. 
and I'm going to do as much work as I can. And then when I'm not doing that, being good about, you know, have an idea, throw it in the notes, you know, make sure that it's there for the next time I have the opportunity to go full throttle. Um, do you have any, any stuff that you do that, that helps? Absolutely, I do. So actually, my day job, I worked at Microsoft as a project manager for a long time. Mm. And so I've, I've really gone deep on agile project management and mm. prioritization, requirements gathering, mm. coming up with plans, coming up with um, specifications. That's what I did at Microsoft for almost 20 years. Mm. So what I do with Mars Society a lot is I have my own sort of prioritization methods mm. to to organize the work I do and the work others do. Um, like one of the things I like to do is have a Kanban board, Kanban board. Oh yeah. Where you kind of go left to right. You have sort of your columns of this is my backlog of work. This mm. is what I'm working on now. And you try not to fill that up too much. And yeah. this is what's, this is kind of what's done, but needs to get reviewed or needs to get right. like deployed or it's mm. not done done yet, but it's kind of almost there. My work is done. And now I'm waiting on other people. So we, I take work a lot through that process cool um it's very important to not overfill the middle part of that <laughs> you don't want to have too much work in progress you want to start things and yeah. finish them mm. you don't want to like have someone tell you stop starting new stuff and finish the things you already have going that's sure. bad you want to definitely be like focused on okay i've got this project i'm going to finish it mm. i have this great idea for something else but uh, i gotta finish this one first and then work on the next thing yeah so that's a big deal for me. I also do this mm. thing called a two by two prioritization matrix. Okay. Which means that I think about what are the things that only I can do and mm. what are things I can delegate to someone else. Ah. That's the top and bottom. Okay. That's so huge. only I can do the stuff on top. The mm. other stuff like has to get done, but someone else could do it besides right. me. And I could delegate that. Ah. And then I look at, is it urgent or not? Yes. Right? So if it's super urgent and I only I can do it, well, that's when I know that's what I need to work on. Yeah. But if it's not urgent and someone else can do it, mm, that's that might not get done by me. That's going to get delegated and that, that might not even happen. Wow. It's not, it's not urgent. So. Yeah. I love, I've never heard of that. That's amazing. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to use that. <laughs> and then here's one, um, other, here's one other tip I give people. If something comes in and it's going to take you less than two minutes to do, mm do it now, do it immediately. That will get it off your plate. Cause mm. a lot of times people will say, Oh yeah, that's going to be easy for me to do. I'll do it later. And then it like blows up or yep. they forget about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's bad, right? If yep. something's quick, just get it done, man. You know, yeah. and that I do that, that, that when I do that type of mindset, if it's mm. quick, I just get it done. And if it doesn't take two minutes, I do put it aside. I do yeah. delay it forever long. Mm -hmm. But if it's quick and I just do it, people get, I have this reputation of, wow, James gets so much done. Yeah. Like James is like on top of all this stuff. Yeah. And it's really just the little stuff I get done fast. And then the, mm. other, the bigger stuff, I work on what only I can do. I love that. I, I, um, I, for me, work, my day job was the place that I've developed a lot of these really good habits. Um, I'll, I'll use that in work. Um, I like to start my day with those small tasks if I have them. Um, I like to build momentum on like how, how good I feel about getting them done. And then that seems to carry me through throughout the rest of the day. Um, yeah, that's that's really great advice. Thank you. Um, I'm definitely gonna start using that stuff. <laughs> that two by two matrix is exciting. I, I've used um, something similar, but it's not delegation related. It's um, like priority related where um, it's like each quadrant has a different uh, Q1 through like Q4. And, um, you know, the first one is immediate and it has to get done like now. Um, the second one is it's good to have, like, it's going to be really important for long term, but, you know, it's, it can get overdone by stuff that needs to get done, like the fires, putting out the fires during the day. That's kind of the first one. Yeah. And then three and four are less important and less urgent as they go down. Um, but I, I like yours, <laughs> I like yours better. Another way to think of things too is, is someone, is someone else waiting for me to do their piece? Ooh. That like so you mentioned when you get up in the morning, you do the small tasks. When yeah. I get up in the morning, I think who's waiting on me mm. to, do, to get their piece done. Cause yeah. I'm the blocker for them. 
Right. Like I'm literally blocking them from making progress on our shared project. Mm. So I got to unblock them first. And maybe it's a little thing like, hey, hey, I know you're waiting on me. Mm -hmm. Here's when I'm going to give you the thing. Mm. Like it's not going to be today. It's going to be tomorrow. Right. So then right. they know, okay, I, I need to work on something else. James is not ready. Yeah. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good thing to do too. Oh, I like that a lot. But, but yeah, don't block others. Like that's no, bad. no. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny to think about. Um, I like to think about companies, organizations, whatever group of people are working towards a project, like as this living thing and, and, and we're kind of all the organs or, or whatever else, however you want to look, think of it um, in that system. And what you're talking about is making sure that the whole system is talking to each other because a, a lot of what happens is, you know, things, many companies um, and organizations, like it's the lack of that communication that allows the whole thing to, to run efficiently and like not making sure that you're not, we're not wasting money and time and even like people's emotional resources of right. like the stress that comes from stuff like you were talking about making sure i'm not blocking anyone then they feel good about all right i can i can now relax yeah does it work wouldn't on that stuff. distress you if i said to yeah. you, Look, you're waiting on me this thing's important to you mm -hmm. but i'm not going to get to it i'm going to get to it i got mm -hmm. you but I, it's not going to be today because mm -hmm. i have other stuff i promise you you'll have it tomorrow or wednesday or whatever yeah. then yep. that then that de-stresses them they're like okay now i yeah. can plan my week you know, mm -hmm. now I know Wednesday I got James's piece is going to come in right. and I could prepare the other stuff for it. Right. That's, that's a de-stressor. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, damn, this is, this is so cool. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, I, I came across this the other day. Is there a Mars cryptocurrency being developed right now? There actually is. Um, it's called Mars coin. Mm. It's a fork of Bitcoin. It's actually a fork of Litecoin, which is a fork of Bitcoin. And mm. a gentleman named Leonard Lopin, who's German, but he lives in Florida, is the founder of that. And he's a member oh, of the wow. Mars Society. He was also a Mars One candidate. And back oh, in wow. 2014, he did this, he started this project. Um, and it's going really well. He's mm. got it up in a couple of exchanges. Um, and it is um, the Mars Society also, with cryptocurrencies, <clears throat> they, do, they usually do something called a pre-mine where mm. right before they release it to the public, maybe the developers have their own stash of it. Mm. He didn't really do that, but what he did do is he donated the first million units of Mars coin to Mars One and the Mars Society. Oh, wow. And so the Mars Society has had 500,000 uh, units to begin with. And there's about 33,000 outstanding right now mm. total for the market cap of Mars coin. And wow. because Mars One has kind of fizzled out at this point mm -hmm. uh, we were actually able to reach out at the mars society with leonard's help we were able to reach out to fast landstorp who founded mars one yeah and said, hey, you have this donation from mars coin you're not going to use it we have it and he mm. agreed to turn that over to mars society oh, that's, that's awesome so we actually have a million mars coins um <clears throat> they were trading uh at about um five to ten cents wow. recently so that's pretty good it's pretty good, chunk good. Of change and, and it's going to go up because it's scarce and there's demand. Mm. So we're going to, we're holding ours till we get to Mars and hopefully we can use it to, for some projects. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Mars. Um, uh, how has been, how is, uh, where do you see with being so involved in all these different projects, where do you see cryptocurrency being used in, in space when we start going out there pretty regularly? That's a great question. Um, so not just as a currency, but also the concept of the blockchain. Mm. is very important, I think. Um, the, the reason virtual currencies work is they developed something called the blockchain, which is a public ledger. Mm. It's as if all the banks in the world had one database that all the transactions that everyone made with dollars mm. uh, that would all be recorded on that single database. Mm. And you'd be able to track a single dollar, how it was spent throughout its life cycle. That's mm. how Bitcoin works, is you have every transaction is on something called the blockchain. But you wouldn't have to necessarily, and that means that it's, it's immutable, it can't be changed. You're adding on a new mm. block to the end, all the ones before it are permanently fixed. Right. So you can't, you can't go back and cook the books and change the transaction mm. already happened in the past. 
And the way that you confirm transactions is everyone agrees, the whole network, that that new block is a correct block. Mm. So they solve the problem of having a double spend of a, of a virtual currency. You know exactly where the currency has been spent throughout its life cycle. Oh, wow. And so you could actually use that for other things besides currency. You could use that for agriculture. Imagine picking up mm. an apple at a grocery store and, and there's a little QR wow. code on it. You scan the QR code and you'd be able to know where that apple was grown and how long it's spent transit to the grocery store, how long it's been at the grocery store. You'd have that whole life cycle of that apple mm. uh, instantly because it's on the blockchain. So if you can imagine this used for space applications, you know, when we're on Mars and we're generating fuel from the atmosphere of Mars, we could tag that as a resource and mm. put that on the blockchain. And as that resource was traded or consumed, all that information could be recorded. So you could use the blockchain to do inventory. Um, you could use it to do oh, wow. e-commerce. Um, you certainly could use it for currency. But mm -hmm. then you also could use it for things like voting. You know, if you mm. issue shares in a company and each share is tracked on the blockchain, you could use the blockchain to have people vote on initiatives. Mm. And, and the voting could be recorded on the blockchain. So you actually can solve the problem of elections with the blockchain too. That's cr so that's crazy because we I think a lot of us are looking for a way to try and make things uh, <laughs> better in, in, in our voting process, not just in the country, but in, in a lot of different places. I've never you broke it down so nicely, like what the blockchain is. Um, I think there's a bunch of people who are listening that, you know, would like to get into it or have just no idea. I've started getting into it. I would I would not say I'm an expert, but at least enough to start talking about it. Um, are you noticing is it something that I've noticed with with blockchain and, and cryptocurrency and NFTs specifically um, is this. I've seen a lot of value with tying it to something in the real world, you know, having the NFT or whatever, maybe it's, it, it's, it's a cryptocurrency that then ties to something like you mentioned um, fuel resources. Like, I think that's a, that's a really interesting way to think about space moving forward. Do you see that being something people can invest in on earth and make the stuff that's on Mars more valuable and be traded like instantly as the stuff's happening over there or I think there's potential ways to do that. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I'm not an investment advisor and this is not, yeah, investment this is advice, not, a, yeah, this but, is not um, investment advice. <laughs> there are ways and obviously Bitcoin and other cryptos are looked at as investments right now that you know, hmm. Bitcoin's now trading at over $30,000. Yeah. You know, I remember back when it was a hundred dollars, I didn't buy a lot then. I mean, actually bought one Bitcoin for a hundred dollars and sold it at one ninety, And I thought I was the smartest guy ever. <laughs> so, uh, but no, there's definitely going to be, I think, ways mm -hmm. to invest in Mars infrastructure through mm -hmm. these technologies and ways to just kind of create wealth right. through these technologies. Right. Yeah. The so I guess to it's this is this is something that's been asked a few times with everything that's going on with Bezos and Branson going into space. This uh, billionaire aspect to you know having a lot of money and the discrepancy of of wealth uh i think it's a, it's a sore topic um obviously and and the timing granted probably could have been better but you can't time these things out with space developments um where do you see what kind of options do you see going forward because i see the narrative of the um dystopian sci-fi like something like um the expanse Right or we're going to Mars, it's 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 about the discrepancy of of where you are in a class. Do you see going to space? What do you see going to space as being an option for rechanging how we think about humanity and even wealth in, in that perspective? Wow, that's a really deep question. I mean, <laughs> I would I would I believe in egalitarianism and I believe mm. in meritocracy. You know, mm. I grew up in Ohio. I my my family there we owned a farm it's all gone now because meth has ravaged that area mm. and opioids um it's it's really sad when i think about it mm. but i've basically been able in my own life to to just advance where i'm in socially and and, and economically by my work by the yeah. work i do the technology i work with working at microsoft and doing all the things i do for nonprofits. um because i worked hard 
And I feel like when people start colonizing space, they're gonna when they go out to Mars and the moon, there's gonna be a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. So the people that are good at accomplishing things, I think will will have more influence. Mm. It doesn't really matter what they where they've come from and what right. their class was here on Earth or their, mm. their heritage here on Earth or, or, or race, you know, their culture. It's not going to matter because we're all we're all in it together to explore space and right. we have to work together. And it's life and death out in space. If you have someone that's incompetent, people might start dying. So yeah. you know, it's it's going to be really important that people know what they're doing and are, do it well and and have pride in their work. And mm. I think that is a great equalizer. Um, uh, certainly, there's going to be rich people in the future, mm-hmm. but I think that there's enough ways to create wealth, and there's such an abundance of resources and space. Mm. I do believe in a future of abundance. I yeah. do not believe in Malthusianism that we have to all fight over a pie and mm. we have to all fight over pieces of the pie. Like the whole idea of peak oil, you know, mm. right. here's how we're going to solve oil. We're going to switch to better technologies. That's yeah. how we're going to solve running out. If, if we ever ran mm. out of oil, mm. you know, yeah. um, and that would be a bad thing because then we, we've burned all the oil right. and put it into the atmosphere. Um, and right. so, I think we need to innovate our way out of the current problems on earth with yeah. new ideas and new technologies and hard work. Mm-hmm. And I believe space is a way to catalyze that. Yeah. I think, you know, there was a, uh, I, I heard Jeff Bezos talk at the international space development conference a couple of years ago before COVID, mm. uh, with the national space Society's conference. And what he said was we need to move a lot of the heavy industry off of earth onto the moon and on, into space Mm. because we we can rezone the earth as residential and light industrial and have mm. you know, everyone working in tech jobs basically and service jobs you know not no, no pollution on the earth and right no like strip mining the earth because you don't need to strip mine the earth there's all these asteroids out there to get the same right materials you're trying to get by strip mining the earth yeah so and there's so much ways to generate power in space with solar power. Mm-hmm. The sun is an, is an amazing resource it is. that we are just not using mm-hmm. at all uh, and enough on earth to, for solar power. And for, mm-hmm. I mean, you can build a solar power satellite. That's been a concept that's been around a long time. Yeah. And I believe the federal government or the state government should put money into that. Mm-hmm. Go build a solar power satellite and beam the power back to earth that would solve a lot of the issues that we have with um, pollution. Mm. I mean, you know, we mentioned cryptocurrency before. What's crazy right now is that there are like tens of thousands of people in China that burn coal to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. Like that's the wrong approach. We need to figure out how a better <laughs> proof of work system for Bitcoin. Yeah. We also need to figure out a better power generation system for humanity than mm. green fossil fuels. And we, I think we have it figured out. It's wind and solar, and those mm-hmm. technologies are developing or uh, are, are becoming more efficient every year and yeah. cheaper every year. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see things like towns in the, in the, the Midwest and the South that are building wind farms mm. and creating jobs by doing that. That's great. So, That's great. Um, you know, solar up here in the Northeast. Yeah, solar up here in the Northeast is, is is definitely growing a lot. I think there's, for whatever reason, um, specifically in, in Massachusetts on on Cape Cod, there's a like a. The windmill is looked at something that makes the scene look ugly, which I don't understand. But um, it's it's weird how how that kind of stuff happens. Um, but going back to uh, the the deep question, like I think, I think there is this. We're, we're stuck, especially in politics, but in general, we're stuck thinking about the problem of Earth as the problem of Earth. Like we're stuck in inside the dome and we don't even realize that there's so many other options available to us. And a, a lot of people who go to space experience that opening of those possibilities from, from what I've heard of people that have gone up there. You know, they see the curvature of the Earth. They see the thin atmosphere. They see the blackness of space and they realize, oh my God, like we're all in this together what do we do? And that, that opening of those possibilities is what I hope from these billionaires going into space and more people thinking about it, even, even just what has done to people who watched it happen on their phones or TVs, like 
I think it's going to help us think about new solutions that we never even thought were possible. Um, but I think getting people to that point is going to be our biggest hurdle, maybe in the next five to 10 years. Um, cause that argument of why are we going into space again, uh, is, is going to come back. It's already coming back, but, um, getting people to understand like what it is that it does for us, uh, is I think great. And you gave some great explanations of that today. Thank, Thank you. you. What you're calling right what you're describing right now is the overview effect hmm. of, and Jeff Bezos just talked about it this week that as soon as he saw the thin atmosphere hmm. up there and realized that, you know, when we're down here walking around on earth, it looks so huge, but it's just this little thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the earth. And it's so fragile yeah. that you, you, you really think about the impact of climate change and, and how important it is that we solve that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, what, what last thoughts do you have for the folks, the folks at home? Um, everyone out there, you can, if you like space, if you want to be part of all this, you can do it yourself. You don't need special skills. At the Mars Society, we look for volunteers of all skill levels to help with our projects. Um, and we have people that are teachers and um, people that are non-technical that help us test things out, uh, people that are just passionate about space. There's so many ways to get involved. There's, and the one thing that everyone could do is just talk about space to your friends and your family. Because most people don't really think about this stuff. Yeah. Even though it's so cool, um, you know, a lot of people just are heads down with their own lives and this is not part of what enters their consciousness. So mm -hmm. the more you can talk about space to your friends, the more help that you're giving. And that's what, when I go talk to people at NASA and I say, I'm just a regular guy. I'm a tech guy. How can I help you go to space yeah. and develop space and give you give support to NASA? They say, talk to the public, get the mm -hmm. public engaged in space. And that's what everyone could do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you, James. Um, uh, everybody go check out the Mars Society. It's marssociety.org. Yes. Yes. Uh, MarsVR.com. Um, go check out that project. I'm, I can't wait to dive into that. Um, and, 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 you know, check in with the Mars Society, um, you know, see what you can do if, if you're interested in getting into this, like James said, reach out um, and see how you can help advance us to, uh, to this, next, this next level for uh, humanity in space, making things interplanetary. So, James, thanks again for coming on. We appreciate it. Uh, everybody, spread love, spread science, be good, and we'll see you next time on another episode of Today's Space.